welcome everyone to the extremely exciting closing session of the 50 plus shades of gothic conference series in which we will interview dr david hunter who has been very kind to accept our invitation and join us here today welcome professor thank you for being here in an event like this dr david hunter needs no introduction and we are extremely honored that he's here with us today However, let me offer a small overview of his work and relevance. Dr. David Punter has taught at universities in different countries and even continents like uh, the, univers uh, sorry, the University of Bristol being the last one, where he was the research director for the Faculty of Arts. Dr. Punter has written 15 academic books, as well as numerous articles. He is also the editor of 10 academic volumes, many of which revolve around Gothic fiction, on which he is a reputed specialist, maybe, to the opinion of many, the main authority on this theme. On top of that, David Punter has also authored eight volumes of poetry and has published poems and short stories on various anthologies. He currently describes himself as a writer and a poet, as per his website. Welcome, Professor, to our Gothic series closing interview. Thank you again for your availability. Um, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for um, welcoming me here. And it's an honor to be at this conference. Thank you very much, Monica. <laughs> Thanks. Well, um, so I'll start uh, with the first question now. I would like to start this interview talking about Sarah. The titles of your two most famous volumes of, Goth of the Gothic uh, make reference to terror. These are, of course, The Literature of Terror, The Gothic Tradition, Volumes 1 and 2. In the introduction to the first one, you, um, you clearly state that, and I'm quoting the book, Gothic fiction has, above all, to do with terror, end of quote. So um, how do you associate the particular features which we, which, sorry, with which you describe the Gothic genre to the fact that they always create terror, can you think of some exception? Well, thank you very much, Monica, for that, that question. Of course, um, when, when I published those books, that was, um, oh my goodness, um, 40 years ago. Um, and I suppose my, my views have changed or I hope um, developed uh, a bit since, since then. Um, I do think the Gothic and the notion of terror are critically interlinked. But one has to bear in mind that Gothic was from the very beginning, if one takes the beginning to be the late 18th century, to an extent uh, formulaic. So if you take an early novel like Clara Reeves, The Old English Baron, um, I wouldn't imagine that that produced in its audiences uh, a sensation of terror, but it might have produced a kind of frisson of excitement. Um, so I think that terror is a term that sometimes needs to be thought of in, um, in inverted commas. Um, and of course, from the beginning, there was this distinction, um, which is still with us, I think, between terror and horror, with terror being seen as more psychological and horror more to do with what we now call body horror, um, with um, a kind of gross uh, intersection of, of physicality. Um, and of course, that does occur as a dialectic at the beginning of the Gothic, uh, with the frequently cited differences between Anne Radcliffe and, and Matthew Lewis, with Lewis as a far more uh, explicit writer about various um, uh, matters which might uh, cause us to um, feel fear. Um, but I would want to now um, say one or two more things about that because what I had assumed um, in the days when I first wrote about the Gothic as a strand of writing from the 18th century to the present day was that Gothic um, should be seen as a function of whole works, whole novels, whole poems. Um, I always had trouble with that because, for example, in the literature of terror, I talk about Dickens um, and... Uh, you can think of Dickens in terms of the old curiosity shop. Now, the old curiosity shop does contain moments which I would still think of as Gothic, but it isn't a Gothic novel. 
Um, and I think now we might want to be more sophisticated about how the Gothic interweaves with other genres and modes in particular works. Um, you know, um, historical, tragical, comical, you know, the, the whole Polonius uh, thing in, in, in Shakespeare. Maybe, maybe not many works are actually wholly Gothic. Um, and maybe that's okay. Maybe Gothic needs to be thought of as a, as a strand, um, as something, as a vein that runs through works rather than as a, a whole, um, the whole deal, as it were. I, I think of um, early Gothic drama back in the early to mid 19th century, where a, a Gothic play or mini play might crop up in an evening's entertainment alongside satirical works, comical works, farces and so forth. This is all part of an evening's entertainment and, and uh, not many early Gothic writers would have thought of themselves as Gothic writers. They were writers who wrote, among other ways, in, um, in a Gothic vein. If I move on to a different, a different matter related to this, um, it occurred to me when thinking about your question to, to, um, to, to, to think a little bit about Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. Now that's often referred to um, as a Gothic work but I don't think that that story, that novella, invites one to experience terror quite. One certainly has fear about the relationship, the unstable relationship between the governess and, and the children. But I think that what's more um, interesting in, in that work, as an example, is about doubt, suspicion, uncertainty. And I think that the Gothic could be seen as, as a kind of strand in literature, in writing that takes away your usual bearings and means that you're looking at things in a different way. Um, and that's because Gothic always, I think, has to do with transgression of one kind or another. And there's no knowing how far that transgression will go. Once you've transgressed against the usual physical and so-called natural rules, then you might go anywhere. And outstandingly, of course, that's the case when dealing with the, the supernatural, at which the Gothic ha has always done, I think, in one way or another, either through belief in the supernatural or through challenging the supernatural or through criticizing or indeed mocking the supernatural. And self-mockery uh, was in the, in the Gothic, I think, from the beginning. Because once we granted the possibility of ghosts, vampires, zombies, then anything might follow from that. Mm. Does that help with the question? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the, the next question I wanted to ask kind of follows on that, and, and you probably already answered it, but maybe um, we can develop a bit more extensively on, on this topic, which is also related on this uh, boundaries and barriers of the Gothic, because, uh, well, you, you endorse a very inclusive definition of the Gothic in these volumes, which you said, well, were written many years ago, but I think, yeah, this um, first question, I think you, you still believe in that. Um, and yeah, the, the Gothic has always uh, been hard to categorize and there are some horror and science fiction decadent or supernatural works that have been excluded um, by critics from the Gothic category, although there's uh, also some transgression in them. Um, so uh, I was thinking about a particular piece of work, which you indeed include in the second volume of the Literature of Terror, that I personally love, and it's um, Arthur Mahan's novella, The Great God Pan. And um, about this novella, the critics Aidan Reynolds and William Charlton argue that it does not create fear because it is too detailed, and it is more about embracing the occult um, which is commonplace in decadent literature. So what thoughts do you have on the literature of the occult, sometimes written by authors who fearlessly embraced these unknown forces in relation to the Gothic transgression and terror? Thank you very much for that question. Um, my original uh, attempts at defining the Gothic in the literature of terror were indeed um, very inclusive. Um, some might say they were too inclusive, but I was trying to trace this um, strand of the Gothic 
through from the late 18th century to what was then the present day, though that's quite a long time ago now. Um, but in another sense, they weren't inclusive at all because in those early books, I was entirely dealing with an Anglo, you know, with a tradition based in British and to an extent American literature. Um, and now things have changed. We have had a great deal of work done on um, what we might loosely call global Gothic or Gothics of uh, different cultural backgrounds. And I think that the one of the crucial features in these new Gothics, if you like, no, no they're not new Gothics, but the, the, this new, these new critical approaches to Gothic is that there is an intersection between what we, or rather there's a series of intersections between, we, between what we've thought of traditionally as Gothic and what are motifs, some might, some might say folk motifs, within very, very different, very various cultures. Every culture that we know of, I'll rephrase that, every culture I know of has some dealings with the supernatural. And every culture I know of is predicated at least to an extent on attempts to deal with fear. Different cultures deal with that in different ways and therefore different cultures produce different kinds of ghost. But the ghosts are always there from the fox fairies of, of um, Chinese and Japanese writing through to the Wendigo in, in, in North America. Every culture um, that one can think of, I think, has these dealings, which are partly, of course, dealings with the ancestor and dealings with, with death. So we, are, we now have within our purview a very much wider range of materials that we might think of as Gothic. And of course, it's more complex than that because those, um, what we might call originary uh, texts of fear have become inflected recently with European and American Gothic. So that there's a kind of double, there's a kind of mutual feeding between uh, what we think of in the West as Gothic and what has originated in other cultures um, to cope with issues of, of, of fear. And that of course has now fed back into an emerging um, Anglo-American uh, folk horror tradition. Think of the Wicker Man. Um, I'm currently reading a graphic novel by Hannah Eaton called Blackwood, which is all about uh, um, uh, folk motifs in the English countryside. Um, it's all to do with managing fear, lots of Gothic motifs, ghosts and so forth, but it's not really based in that. It's based in some more, some historically different kind of, kind of past. Okay, on the occult, Arthur Macon, The Great God Pan. Tremendous novel, wonderful book. I agree with you entirely, Monica. One of my, one of my favorite books. Um, it's certainly a cult. Is it Gothic? Uh, well, I think you could say it's Gothic if we accept this description, not a definition, but a description of the Gothic as transgressive, specifically in relation to the supernatural, because it deals in the supernatural and to an extent, it accepts the supernatural. But of course, when we think of novels of the occult, then it turns out that almost all of them, in my experience, are actually <coughs> quite intensely moral. They, they don't say that there are dark forces coming to claim us. They say that there is a battle in the world between dark magic and white magic, and that this battle is something that needs to be uh, described in order to restore order, or at least to point out, as Matthew Lewis did, of course, in The Monk, the extreme dangers of challenging the, the boundaries around that order. Let me just mention a couple of other novels of the occult. Um, Alistair Crowley, Moonchild. Crowley, of course, was supposedly a believer in magic. 
in dark magic. <coughs> but again, in the novel, <coughs> it's white magic that, um, that triumphs. A much more interesting and more ambiguous novel, which is not so well known, I think, is by a wonderful writer called M. John Harrison, who's written a long series of science fiction works, but also a book called The Course of the Heart, which is to do with ritual magic, but also with psychological disorder. <clears throat> and the hinge of that book is that what you summon up through magical rituals or through memory cannot be, be banished. And that, of course, is the also the root of recent and not so recent cultural anxieties about the literature and more specifically the film of terror. That, um, as for example, in the um, in the in the visual experience of child's play, then once you have something lodged in your mind, then you can't dismiss it and you may have to, in some sense, act upon it. And that's the cause of lots of moral panics about Gothic and horror texts. Uh, not so usually literary now, but more, more, more filmic. There's an incitement to violence may be uh, a result of, of repeating images. Um, another example, my last one of uh, Literature of the Occult, Peter Ackroyd, his wonderful book, The House of Dr. D which is about John Dee, the famous Elizabethan astrologer and, and magician. And what Ackroyd does is perform a historical engagement with, with ritual magic, um, which is brilliantly ambiguous about whether that magic is or ever could be actually effective. Um, so all through the literature of the occult, I think there is this set of doubts. Are we dealing here with uh, so, I mean, magic, you can, describe, you can describe magic as um, a, a supernatural power over the natural. Yep, the, the, the natural, uh, the physical is not its own master, but supernaturally, in some way, you can control those forces. That's what magic has been about since, um, oh, since the ancient Greeks, I think, at least, and in Chinese culture, probably even longer than, than, than that, where there is magic that goes way back into what we think of uh, as um, uh, deep history. Um, uh, but whether that magic is actually effective or being used as a metaphor, and Crowley, I suppose, is good on this because he does talk about how, for him, even magic is a kind of metaphor for exerting power. Um, and maybe the occult is, is something like that. Although the occult, of course, is also a way of um, uh, forming uh, relationships, uh, forming Small, small groups, think of the Society for Psychical Research at the end of the 19th century in, 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 uh, in the UK uh, and elsewhere, um, then this is a way of, of banding together to um, form some kind of power, often among those who are otherwise powerless. Mm. I'll stop there, sorry, that, that's a too long a reply, sorry. No, it's, it's very interesting. Um... Yeah, I've always been a bit intrigued by the occult because it's it's emergence, well, and in decadent literature, uh, its emergence in cultural terms in the Anglo uh, tradition is quite different from, well, not, maybe not that different from the early Gothic fictions of the 18th century, but the approach is a bit, a bit different and it's always been very intriguing to me. Uh, but um, yeah, you've mentioned a couple of concepts that um, lead me to, to, the, sec to the next question. Uh, the first one, uh, I think you mentioned psychic disorder, and then at the beginning of your answer, you've also mentioned um, the Gothic or fear or terror, um, depending on the different traditions where it emerges in terms of place, and that's where I want to go. It's not very um, transgressive what I'm going to say because I'd like to to talk about the United States. Um, which, well, this is a, a series about the United States. So uh, again, in the introduction to volume one of the literature of terror, you seem to express the belief that the nature of the fear of the Am American reappearance of gender and its beginning, it's completely different in its psychic dimension compared to 18th century English Gothic or British Gothic. Uh, so in your works, in your words, and, and I'll quote uh, the book, this new American Gothic seems to deal in landscapes of the mind, um, end of quote. 
this is also has Ro Rosemary Jackson, who wrote uh, a book about uh, fantastic uh, fiction, um, defines the Gothic genre. Uh, she, she defines it as a recognition that fears are created by the self or by unconscious forces. Um, but you seem to believe that in uh, earlier, or at least the original um, British Gothic um, works, the earlier ones, there was a sort of more external fear compared to the reappearance of the genre in the American context. So, so can you elaborate a little bit on, on that in relation to what is unique to the American Gothic? And, and I'm sorry to keep quoting uh, this book, which as you said, maybe <laughs> you've changed your mind about. I'll, I'll move on to the next one yeah. in the next question. Yeah. Not at all. Well, well I, I, I can try. Uh, um, there were many critics far more expert than I am on the US dimension. Um, Charles Crow, uh, Maisha Wester, Marilyn Michaud, Bernice Murphy have all written very powerful books on, on, um, on, on US uh, Gothic. Um, to slightly sidestep that for a moment, but I'll come back to the United States. Um, I think I would no longer say that there is a distinction between inner and outer fears, but there are different ways in which they might be represented. Um, let me give a slightly strange example. <clears throat> I was recently reviewing a book on Polish Gothic. And the author, Agnieszka uh, Roshanin, discusses uh, ruins. And of course, ruins are um, a theme in, in the Gothic right from the 18th century through to um, oh, Ian Banks, A Song of Stone. I mean, um, Shirley Jackson, lots of material. The, the ruins, ruins run right through uh, Anglo-American Gothic. But the points made in this book that um, although ruins also run through Polish Gothic, they mean something quite different. Because in Britain, ruins represent the legacy of internal strife, largely religious. Monasteries being destroyed, abbeys being burned to the ground, all in the course of religious strife within, within the UK. Whereas in Poland and in Polish Gothic, those ruins are almost always the effect of a destructive invasion from other nations and empires, which have sought over several centuries to destroy Poland. And, and in fact, they succeeded you know, twice in Poland, vanishing from the, um, the map of Europe. So, all I mean to point out by that is that the any repertoire of Gothic motifs, the ruin, the castle, even the persecuted maiden, depending on gender politics in different polities, will be different in, in, in different, um, different locations. And so um, fears in the US will also be differently coded. So here's a huge generalization. And um, I'm not an expert on this, and I expect I'm quite wrong. Nevertheless, it seems to me that a lot of US Gothic is, its anxieties are about insurrection from within. Whereas in European Gothic, certainly in the Anglophone tradition, a lot of those fears are about invasion from without. Now that is a vast generalization. There are many, many exceptions, but, but I, that's something which I think may have some mileage in it. And um, therefore in the US, I think the, the return of the repressed, whether that be through anxiety about the indigenous races and their fate, or terrors about the um, effects of, of, of slavery, um, uh, these, I think, are, are very much to the forefront in US Gothic. They're, they're more on the back burner, I think, in, in, in Britain. But in the US, I think that these are sometimes very interestingly coded. And I want to make reference here to Stephen King, who I believe is a great American novelist. A lot of American critics over the 
decades, even the last century, have, have wailed and moaned about the question of where is the great American novelist? And they've said, oh, he or she has not yet arrived. I think he has, I think he did. I think it's Stephen King, but you can't confront Stephen King or face Stephen King, partly because King is um, boxed into a genre, gothic or horror, whatever you call it, and partly because what he does with that is based not in these returns of the repressed. He rarely writes about um, about slavery. He never writes that I've, no, that's not true. He very rarely writes about um, the fate of indigenous peoples. He does write about small town USA and he writes about it in terrifying ways. And the novel of his, I think is the best, is called Needful Things. Now in Needful Things, the devil arrives in small town USA. Doesn't matter where it is. And the devil sets up a shop. And in that shop, he can give you anything you want. And the people in the town who appear fairly peaceful, but actually have these huge antagonisms one to another, they come asking for various things they think will help in these disputes and the devil helps. And of course, the devil's a helpful kind of chap. But in the end, it turns out that all people actually want, all they need, their needful thing is a gun. So the devil provides guns and, and there you go. And there you have the history of contemporary USA, I suppose. Black Lives Matter. And I'm always puzzled by the assertions of the um, National Rifle Association in the USA, who say, of course, repeatedly, guns aren't the problem. Well, I don't think they're right, but if they are right, what's the alternative? If guns aren't the problem, then something deep in the US psyche must be the problem. There's no third way. It's got to be one thing or the, or the other. Um, so you're talking there about a deep traumatic root of disturbance in the US, which is what I think US Gothic keeps on trying to, to gnaw at, I think. Um, although maybe recently, ju just a few more small points, maybe recently the threat of invasion um, is, is back. Um, I think about Max Brooks's wonderful book, World War Z, um, and how the US remains no longer immune. And of course, now with this current pandemic, then we see again that the US is not immune to, 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 to invasion. Um, uh, another kind of return, I think, is represented in Cameron Hurley's wonderful uh, set of books, The Belle Dame Apocrypha, which is about the violence of women um, and about the return of the ravaged deserts, so, so, so that what the US ha has done uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq and so forth, comes back, um, comes back home. And to go back to King again, Stephen King again, in his book Cell, he refers rather memorably to the, the possibility, the threat of Americans being, and I quote, refugees in our own land, which of course echoes um, Cormac McCarthy's um, The Road. So things are going on there, I think, in, in, in US Gothic at the at the moment, uh, and, and um, think back a little way, then of course you get back to, to Edgar Allan Poe um, and the Mask of the Red Death, um, which is, is indeed a precursor of anxieties about pandemic. But interestingly, of course, most of Poe's most fearful texts are transposed out of the US back into a kind of mythical Europe. Okay. Yeah, that's a wonderful. <laughs> um, answer. At the, at the Stephen King novel, it's, it's just like a great example of something, yeah, really um, specific to a certain tradition. Yeah, but, but thank you very much for this answer. Um, so I, I'm going to move on to something a bit different, and it also has to deal with um, like I, something that you've been mentioning, which is like changing your mind um, about things that you wrote in the past. and. Um, Unlike many goth, uh, many scholars with a background on the literature of the previous centuries, although your background is extensive and you never historicize the Gothic in absolute terms, you also have an interest in the critical framework of deconstruction. And this is particularly visible in your 2007 book, Metaphor, um, especially in the seventh uh, chapter, uh, Metaphor of Difference on Translatability. Although I, I can see, and correct me if I'm wrong, a deconstructive form of writing throughout all of your texts. I, I enjoyed reading this text very much. 
Um, so this book was published after the ones on the Gothic that I've been mentioning so far. So has your latest interest in deconstruction added something new to your perception of the Gothic? Yes, thank you again for that question. Uh, um, I, I think it has. Um, I am interested in deconstruction. Um, on the positive side, um, I find that um, Derrida's writings and um, Christeva's writings to, to, to an extent uh, and, and some others um, provide a kind of um, jouissance, a kind of enjoyment in the twists and turns of language. And I think deconstruction is, can almost be defined as an alertness to the ways in which words never say exactly what they mean, or they never mean exactly what they say which I think is the same thing, actually. Uh, uh, and I think that is um, it's extremely important not to get boxed in by the notion that words have a conventional, acceptable history and that they can be defined entirely in the ways in which they're defined by, by dictionaries, because words are always, I, I think words are always small explosions. Almost any word that you can use has other meanings uh, hidden or partly visible within it. And that's only thinking about them in terms of one language and their etymology. And of course, when you spread that out across a range of languages, then matters become even more complex. I also think that deconstruction is in a sense a development of a political position and specifically um, a Marxist position, though very few deconstructive thinkers would agree with me on that because what Marx said about ideology mm. before the term ideology got debased was that ideology is a way of purveying the world upside down so that you're taught to ignore the real causes of things, in his case, the real economic causes, and to focus on the superstructure as though that's what causes things, which it doesn't. This is a complicated situation. I don't want to go in, into any more detail about that, but I, I think the deconstruction follows on from that, even while not wanting to, in trying to expose this kind of upside down view of the world that we are continually exposed to. So that's on the positive side. On the negative side, <clears throat> I think there are real problems with the ways in which deconstruction has been interpreted as the possibility of a slide into total uh, relativism. And I worry increasingly about whether that connects with or has been made to connect with current, uh, the current discourse of um, fake news. Because when deconstruction says there is nothing but the word, then it's in danger of saying, therefore, there is no such thing as pain. And pain for me is the touchstone. You can say there's no such thing as death because different cultures view death differently. I, I can understand that, you know, some cultures don't acknowledge death, that, that, that's grand, good for them. Um, I wish we didn't, but uh, there we are. And some religions don't acknowledge death and that's good too, that's absolutely fine. But pain for me is the touchstone. You can't not acknowledge pain. It's real and it's physical. And I don't think deconstruction has a rhetoric for coping with, um, with that. Or therefore, with the many painful experiences that most people in the world go through. Um, Another thought I have had recently about deconstruction is that it's a kind of experimental criticism, and I like that, you know, that, that, that's good, we all need to experiment, but it does seem to me that it's coincided rather oddly with a decline in what we used to think of as experimental fiction. Um, except, of course, for flash fiction, 
which I think of as fiction for those with a, a short attention span. I'm not very fond of, of, of flash fiction. Um, <coughs> to go back to deconstruction, I think we're at a kind of cusp or maybe beyond it in relation to, to high theory. I'm not sure anybody cares much about high theory anymore. I think there are more pressing concerns, mainly about the, the realignment of the canon so that we no longer have a kind of, you know, male supremacist view of, of writing, no longer a white supremacist view of writing. These things have moved on amazingly in the last, um, in the last 20 years. And that, that is obviously all to, all to the good. Um, if I can add a brief um, footnote to that, uh, which I suppose is partly about the, the current pandemic. Um, I'm interested in the way in which deconstruction speaks about uh, different kinds of, of um, uh, speed of, of writing and, and reception. But thinking about that took me back recently to um, Paul Virilio, uh, a major cultural critic um, who about, I think it was about 40 years ago, wrote a book called Speed and Politics. And what he was saying was that the, the real privilege in political life has to be geared to speed so that if you can travel faster, you can conference faster, you can influence faster, so you can be part of the world as it moves. If you're stuck in one location, you can't influence how, how things go on. It's a fairly obvious point, but he goes into great detail at different speeds. Um, he also, the, the quotation which I just looked up um, just before this interview, which I just wanted to check, really fascinating. It's not from Speed and Politics, from a different book of his, where he says, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. I think that's the most wonderful crisp statement about how every advance produces or can produce its own disaster. And I take it that's the situation with the pandemic. I mean, I, I presume it's been spread by global air travel. I presume also in the way of inversion, uh, people now or governments now choose to try to blame um, poorer communities, um, uh, communities who don't have access to power, choose to say that they spread um, the pandemic. Actually, it's spread by the super rich um, and their air travel. Uh, I mean, if you look at the figures for how um, how many people travel by air, I mean, three three percent of, of people in the world do ninety percent of the world's air travel. I think that's the right figure. It's very close to it, anyway. Uh, anyway, I'm getting a bit heated here. I, I shouldn't I shouldn't do that. I think, but my point about the pandemic, if I just continue that for a moment, is, is that what we have at the moment is a speeding up. Like this, for example, Zoom, you know, international conferences, speeding up of the interchange of ideas and are slowing down. Will air travel ever really function again? And interestingly, a great deal of Gothic has traditionally been about claustrophobia. We think of Poe again, we think about all those castles of Radcliffe and Lewis and, 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 and so forth. And we think about the imprisoned um, heroines and um, uh, cells and uh, prisons and dungeons and, and, and so forth. A rare exception, actually, is the wonderful writer Algernon Blackwood, who writes entirely about agoraphobia, but he, he's a different... Um, but I'm interested, looking forward, into whether that's going to change, because I don't now know whether our greater fear is of isolation, that's claustrophobia, or a fear of public spaces and what might be transmitted through them as in a pandemic situation. And I, I'm interested to know how Gothic will, um, will emerge and cope with that. I'm sure it's doing so already, um, but there's a, lot, a long way to go, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. Um, I'm really fond of deconstruction, but I do, yeah, I'm, I'm confused as well uh, by the tendency to relativize everything that it might lead to, but yeah, I think I think that's the wrong approach to deconstruction. I think it has a lot of possibilities, and and yeah, you've, you've just described it perfectly. Um, I do have just a small last question, but maybe 
really quick one because uh, we, we need to proceed to the Q&A um, section. Yep. Um, it's um, well, just um, about your own creative writing. Uh, you have written eight volumes of poetry, the last of which, well, I think it's not the last now, and it was, well, I was preparing for this interview. Uh, it's titled Those Other Fields. That's not the last one anymore, is it? Well, no, but never mind, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, according to you, uh, in your website, um, yeah, this yeah. Is about events that happened in 2020. So I'd like to ask you about the process of writing during such a difficult time. Um, I think, uh, personally, uh, that the Gothic mode survives because it allows us to deal with the unspeakable. So I am therefore curious about how it feels on the other side, um, where you have to deal with writing about these um, unspeakably difficult times. So if you can tell us a little bit about uh, this experience and then we, could, we shall proceed to the Q&A session. Thank you, Monica, I'll keep it brief. Um, yeah, those other fields was my last book, book one. Um, I published one since then called Stranger. Those other fields were straightforwardly political, but it was mainly focused on, on refugees, which of course has now become not the, not the major issue of our times, which I think is, um, is a shame because the whole issue of refugees is how we code our fear of the other. Stranger has more ghosts. But the poems I'm writing now seem to be more about the local, the immediate, small incidents that happen outside my study window. So maybe that reflects the way in which we've all been driven back on ourselves during the pandemic. And the questions are, I think, about how we'll behave when we are freed from lockdown, how we are beginning to behave as lockdown comes, uh, comes up. Will we rampage or will we emerge blinking into the sunlight? Um, just one very small point. Um, I don't know about in other parts of the world, but in the UK, we've had this continuous repetition of this terrible mantra, it is what it is. That's supposed to make you feel at ease with things and not mind too much about lockdown and so forth. Well, Hegel often said, it is what it isn't. And the Urban Dictionary online that you may know is especially good on it is what it is. And it says that it is what it is is a code for saying it will always be what it is. So it's a way of telling us not to even think about change, not to imagine, not to imagine a future. And the Gothic is all about imagination, about possibilities, maybe especially when they're transgressive. So I think we need to resist that terrifying thought, it is what it is. Sorry, that's mine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've, I've just been recently reading about utopia ah. and precisely writing um, helps to contest this it is what it is absolutely yeah yeah thank you yeah thank you thank you very much for this such a nice conclusion uh, so I think we're, we're ready now to move on to the Q&A session um, you can raise uh, use the raise hand uh, tool um, on zoom yeah, I think we've got a question now, and if your camera or microphone doesn't work, you can also type it on the chat uh, and just be reminded that you're going to appear. Uh, this is being recorded, so uh, just uh, put on your camera if you're comfortable with it. Um, if I have a question by Anna now, so um, yeah. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the absolutely interesting talk. And what I wanted to ask you um, is that I see that you um, maybe more recently have worked on Mexican Gothic and Mexican stuff. And as I work on that, um, I found that very interesting. And also um, some remarks you made on the border and how the border can be a place uh, where some gothic uh, happens in a way. So uh, could you briefly, because I know that I'm possibly the only one interested in this, <laughs> but just um, say a few words on why the Mexican gothic interests you and uh, how you find this, um, this kind of border issue, issues um, somehow uh, connected with terror and horrific uh, realities and narratives. Mm. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, um, 
I had written a couple of things on, on um, Mexican Gothic, but I, I'm no I'm no expert. But I, I think that Mexican Gothic is a kind of classic, maybe the classic site of intersection between what I was mentioning earlier as folk traditions and um, cultural appropriation. Because Mexico can obviously be seen uh, in very large scale terms in, as a continuous struggle between the indigenous and the imperialized. Um, and that's been so for a very long time. And, and, and it, it's, it was accentuated again during the, during the Trump years, what one hopes that will be a little more relaxed now. So on the one hand, you have the, um, America, you have the Mexican um, traditions of you know, the Day of the Dead, the, 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 the death cults and so forth. On the other, you have the continuous threat of invasion or takeover from the, um, the bully uh, in the north. Um, that, I think, produces a very interesting form of Gothic, which is, of course, full of fear and anxiety, but also is curiously um, jaunty. I'm thinking of the writer here, um, uh, Esquibel. I can't remember her, her first names now, uh, Waterlight Chocolate. Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah, that, yeah. Waterlight chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And 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 the others. And um, that's an interesting book, of course, in itself. Because um, I was saying something earlier on about Gothic being a kind of hybrid form, never quite as pure as we'd like to think. And that, of course, is a hybrid book. You know, it's a cookbook, uh, and it's a book about a family, um, and it's a book about real, um, real terror, isn't it? Or, or at least fear. Um, uh, uh, but it has a kind of uh, a jaunty kind of tone to it, it seems to me, as though it's as though in Mexican Gothic, uh, to quote Kierkegaard, the dreadful has already happened, that something terrible has happened in the past. And whatever happens now, it can't be worse than that. And we'll manage somehow to survive it. Um, that's the kind of tone I get from Mexican writing, which I get from very few um, other countries. Uh, I'm not sure they're making sense, and as, as I say, I'm not an expert, and also I don't speak Spanish, and I think that's a real handicap when you're trying to deal with, 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 with Mexican Gothic or with any South American Gothic. Um, but I do think that, that if, if, if Gothic can also be not just a site of transgression, but also a site of resistance, Mm -hmm. Then I think there is some resistance evident in, in, in Mexico Gothic, some resistance of being entirely taken over. Even when most of the films being watched in Mexico are US films, and that is the case, I still think that their reception is not the same as it would be in the US, that there is still, still some Mexican difference. But, but, but on the other hand, I think one must be careful not to romanticize that Mexican resistance um, because, you know, Mexico has numerous indigenous difficulties and problems which, which won't be solved, you know, by, 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 by simply reading its, its literature. But, but, um, but yeah, I, 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 did, I do find that site of cultural resistance and reaffirm, reaffirmation of the Mexican past very, um, very intriguing, and especially because it's done through a lot of motifs which in themselves are, are, are quite terrible. Um, and, and, you know, um, uh, writing about it, it's Octavio Path, isn't it, who, who, who yeah. refers to Mexico as, as a kind of a culture of death, really, a, mm -hmm. a culture of death. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that's all there in, in the mix as well. Sorry, that's not very, I know that's very helpful, but... but uh... No, I think I, I do agree with you because I find, um, in general, Mexican fiction of this kind uh, to have this connection with the past, but like a, a ghostly, uh, ghastly past, you know, it, it's like they're haunted. And if in a, if in a way, as you say, uh, it can be a place of resistance. It can also be a place of not moving on in a way. Yes. You know, it's it, it it's kind of um, 
it has these two different sides, and I think uh, you can you can feel it sometimes in the in Mexican fiction, and and I do think that absolutely the border and in a metaphorical and material sense, it's a, it's a absolutely a place for that. Yeah. But but I find that I don't know. I would like to find a lot more uh, fiction, uh, Mexican fiction, on the border. But I think it's still too too present in a way. You know, they they can do that uh, haunting from the past with with the colonial past with the uh, pre-colonial past, but not even with the, even with the re revolutionary uh, times uh, as the Laura Esquivel's uh, book goes about. But I think it's still too early maybe for a real Gothic of the border. I don't know. I don't know either, although, of course, we're, we're gothic of that border, that then it takes you back to Cormac McCarthy, doesn't it, and, and, and uh, the trilogy. Yeah, <laughs> and, and also, I think there are very uh, few um, films, and, uh, well, I work also on comics, so uh, also some comics, but somehow not enough. I, I find, for example, uh, the movie The Sleep Dealer, that science fiction hmm. but not quite it does have a kind of a gothic edge because there are these migrants that are attached to machines and they work from mexico in the u.s yes. attached to virtual reality machines so i think maybe this border fiction is still trying to find somehow a way i don't know yes. Yes. but i think it's scary i mean the border is scary so it, it could give for a lot of uh, anxieties uh, conveyed through fiction, really. Yes. Uh, well, yes, I, I, I think you said it much better than I could. But, but I think that that, um, that is partly what separates um, Gothic fiction in the uh, British tradition from lots of other Gothics, because um, I think it's fair to say that in the British tradition, we don't have those anxieties about borders mm. um, because we don't have any. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so we are ignorant of, of borders as we're ignorant of uh, invasion or pretend we are or have been for a long time. Um, of course, we are everywhere, everywhere is, is invaded. There's a wonderful <clears throat> poem in the 18th century by, by Defoe um, called The True Born Englishman, which just lists all the various peoples that the so-called true-born Englishman in the early 18th century is actually made up of. Um, we are a hybrid race and so on and so forth, but we don't care to acknowledge that, I don't think. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Very interesting discussion. Uh, I think we've got another question by Laura. Mm -hmm. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I was um, I was very excited when you mentioned Paul Virillo in this idea of technology and speed and, and in relation to power because he's he's often discussed in relation to Marshall McLuhan and I, I'm come from I come from the field of communication and media studies and I I'm very fond of McLuhan as a theoretical framework. And, and I was thinking of this very commonly quoted idea in his work of the medium is the message. And I wanted to ask you if you had um, any comments that you could share with us in, in terms of the, the Gothic modes and the Gothic strands that you were mentioning in the beginning and how they are expressed through different mediums. If there is a specific way in which the Gothic modes and strands vary according to medium and in which one if any, is a better medium for, for that to be expressed. You mean through written text, through film, through TV, through video, through games, yeah. and so forth? Yes, I see. Well, uh, um, as, you, as you say, these are all, these are all uh, different, different media. Um, uh, and I don't know that one could say that one is, um, <clears throat> in any sense, um, better than, than, than another. Uh, I suppose um, 
I suppose you might say that, that some media are more culturally um, effective than, than others. And I suppose that mixed media, um, visual and verbal, are always bound to be more effective in some way than, 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 than ones restricted to one medium. Not me. I mean, it seems to me now that um, if uh, effectivity is the main criterion, rather than quality or subtlety or density of thought, then obviously um, a meme is going to have more power than any other kind of form. Um, I'm thinking just as one example um, of a meme that um, uh, a colleague worked on some little while ago, which you probably know, probably better than I do, um, called uh, Slender Man. Yes. that ring a bell? Yes, yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, obviously had, had enormous um, uh, purchase, really. Uh, although, I don't know, perhaps you can enlighten me about this. Uh, I mean, Slender Man got everywhere, but, um, but what, was the, what was the purpose? What was the point? Or is the point that there is no point? Is the point in simply showing that you can get anywhere with, 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 with a meme, regardless of what that meme might mean? Or was the point to um, instill and foster a kind of fear parallel to, parallel to but not, not effective in the way of, um, a serial killer or stalker? Was that the point? I think it might be a bit of both in the sense that it would, in the sense that it worked, because it came from a creepy pasta, if I'm not mistaken, and in, in in the sense that how these ideas are spread on the internet and 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 just the capacity, I, th I think the point is that it has the capacity to get to a wider yes. and wider audience. Yes, and that's yes. That, that that's what's dependent on the medium. Yes, that it's, yes. it's more yes. affected by virtue of the numbers yes so that 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 virtually is a kind of pure example of the medium is the message uh, the message is nothing more than the medium in which it's conveyed yeah mm. the, me the message is the speed at which you can convey um th this um uh image as it were but the image mm. doesn't mean anything beyond that slender man is a slender image maybe that was the point an image without depth, an mm -hmm. image that's purely of the surface. Virilio might like that idea, I think. Uh... Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. <laughs> Do we have a question on the chat um, by Natalia? Um, correct me if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly. But she says she cannot turn on the camera, so I'll read it now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, she says, thank you very much for your enlightening, thought-provoking talk. I would like to ask you whether the modern Gothic authors are interested in using um, mythological patterns in their works. Well, uh, um, some are, some aren't, obviously, but, but, but um, and, and also, again, it depends what you think of as modern Gothic authors. I mean, the authors that come to my mind most immediately as using mythological patterns or making up new mythological patterns are, um, firstly, um, Russell Hoban, who I don't think one would call a Gothic author in every way, but his novel Ridley Walker, I think, is certainly uh, involved with issues of, of, um, of fear and, 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 and terror, and uh, uses a huge mix of um, myths to, to sustain that. Um, and also Neil Gaiman, who, 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 I mean, again, I'm not sure one would think of as a, a Gothic author, <coughs> but is clearly involved all the time with, 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 um, with remaking myths and making them into more fearsome versions. If you go back a little way, then I suppose a more acceptedly Gothic writer would be Angela Carter, um, who is often, I think, taken within the, the Gothic canon, at least again, partly, but not wholly, um, uh, and uh, is obviously interested in myth, in fairy tale, in folklore, and gains some of her most terrifying effects from that. But again, Angela Carter is a very good example, I think, of how difficult it is to speak these days of a wholly Gothic author. And it's interesting, it's, this has gone in two different ways. 
Um, if you look in the bookshops, then you don't find shelves or devoted to the Gothic. You do find shelves devoted to horror. And in the bigger bookshops, you find shelves devoted to what is now called dark romance. These are, but what's mostly on those shelves are books written specifically to figure in the charts and the sales pertaining to those labels. Um, whereas a writer like Carter would figure, I think, in the general fiction shelves. And if you tried to classify her, you would use such a number of, 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 of labels. And the first, of course, would be feminist. Um, or, or women's fiction, depending on how you know what, what kinds of labels, what kinds of labeling one is using. Then you might think of, of gothic. You'd never think of horror, um, not in relation to Carter. Um, you might think of satire. Um, uh, you might think of cultural criticism. That there's all manner of ways in which you could seek to <coughs> classify Carter's works, her, her fiction as well as her, her essays. Um, but none would be wholly satisfactory. It, it comes back to the whole, the whole way in which literary criticism tries to deal with questions of, of, of genre, which now has become more complicated because of course there are many, many writers, maybe the majority of writers, who write to fulfill a specific genre demand. So that writers sit down and say, I'm going to write a dark romance. I'm going to write um, a work of science fiction. I'm going to write, and so on and so forth. I, there's nothing wrong with that, um, but it does mean that we now have this odd divide between genre fiction, so-called, and general fiction, which is not in a genre. Um, is it superior? Is it literarily superior to genre fiction? Is it simply unclassifiable? Um, is it better or worse for that? So it's a very strange situation, I think. Um, and. Um, of course, it affects Gothic because Gothic has never, I think, really emerged as a genre in quite that sense. It's, a, it's an academically um, reputable genre. Some would say it's the academically reputable version of horror, you know, that's possible. But it, it, but it doesn't sell in the bookshops in itself as Gothic. Um, it might sell through horror, it might sell through certain kinds of graphic novel, might sell through dark romance, always mediated through some other more um, popular, in inverted commas, form, because Gothic has this curious position of being and having been immensely popular without ever being popular. It's had a kind of um, ring of something slightly above um, popular genres. Does that make sense? I, um, um, yeah, just makes sense to me. <laughs> so I can type uh, something else on the chat if you'd like, Natalia. But um, now I think we have time for one last question. Uh, so we're running out of time. So I just um, give the floor to Paul as our last um, person to ask a question. Yeah. Good evening, David. Hello, Paul. Um, I, one of your quotes, actually, that I always use when I, when I teach the Gothic and cinema is you call the uncanny, I think, um, a savage negation of history, which I think is a wonderful phrase to, to think about the uncanny and the way in which you kind of um, make us think about the way that we look at the world and, and we re-see this world in which we think uh, we live and the world that we think we know. And I just wanted to, to pick up on, on something you talked um, a, a few moments ago about borders. And I don't know if you're familiar with the British TV series, Humans. Have you come across that series? I, I have heard of it, but I, I've never, I haven't actually seen it, I'm afraid. Yeah, no. it's, it's a really interesting piece because it's actually about kind of sentient robots. It's about AI and, and this kind of thing. But in reality, it's, it's kind of allegorical because it's about the migrant crisis and it's about oh. Britain becoming swamped by, by these kind of beings that come from, from without. Um, and it just it just led me to think about do you do you think that in the 21st century one of the hallmarks of the gothic is that it's become more political it's become a force of, of subversion and resistance to to big government and to um, and here I'm thinking about um, well humans for example in the sense in which it's very much about um, about about the government that we've had in the UK for many years 
um, about the living under um, austerity and this, these kind of politics. Um, and that very much in the US, it's become a way to kind of um, to reflect on what has happened in, in, the, in the past few years with the Obama administration and, and then the administration of Trump. So that it's becoming a, a lot more kind of politically focused than perhaps it was historically. Well, th th that's a really interesting question. Um, I think my short answer is um, I would hope so. Um, I, I think that uh, one way of going at that would be to think about the, um, uh, if you like, the history of the zombie um, and how uh, that's always been uh, infused to an extent with the political. You think back to um, uh, the early film White Zombie, um, Val Halperin, wasn't it, back in the 1920s? I, I'm not an expert. Yeah, yeah, th yeah, 30s, I think, but yeah. 30s, yeah. Yeah, which obviously was making um, some extremely important points about uh, about slavery and, and exploitation, um, and at the same time doing it in, in a way which was itself um, almost a kind of um, exploitation film. It's, it's a brilliant kind of melding of, of popular form and, and um, political content. Um, and then uh, if you think through with, with the zombie, uh, then I suppose, um, the zombie becomes a kind of um, uh, multivalent code, doesn't it, for, for all manner of, of, um, of oppression. Um, and um, I think that the, those relations between the notion of the zombie and um, slavery and, um, and mindlessness have become more focused in recent years. Um, and um, again, I could allude to works I've already mentioned, Stephen King's um, Cell, you know, which is about zombification through through cell phones. I mean, um, uh, um, uh, and very um, a very potent thought that is. Um, and again, um, <coughs> excuse me, World War Z, um, where the um, where, where the zombies prove capable of invading even the US. And one of the wonderful things about World War Z is how different nations react in different ways, which gives um, good scope for Max Brooks to, to talk about um, different national priorities and to give his own views on how those national priorities might themselves be um, exploitative and, and open to, to, um, to critique. Um, uh, I won't mention examples right now, but, but, but um, there are plenty of them in that, in that book. Um, I, I think, I've said I hope you're right, and I also think you're right. And I think, I mean, I've read quite a bit of um, lockdown poetry recently. Um, some of it published poetry, some of it just written by, by, by colleagues I'm in poetry groups with. And that motif of the, um, you know, the coming of the, of the mindless, I think is, is, is very much there. But I think we have to be, to be very careful. I, I mean, um, because when you're speaking of zombies, then you can be speaking of that which is done to people, zombification by governments or by capitalism or by uh, slave control. But um, by speaking of zombies, you may also be depriving uh, sources of possible resistance or indeed, dare one say it, revolution of true agency. Um, so I think the, the political force of that can go in two directions. That's a very general um, kind of thought, but but, but um, it does that does worry me a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's it, it's interesting you mentioned the zombie as well, given the the context that we're in with the pandemic, and to see how that now plays out in terms of whether there is a, a spate of of zombie movies and zombie graphic novels which reflect that notion of of people being contaminated in some way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Hey, okay, thank you, Paul. Well, thank you, Paul. You've had such, such a good Q&A session. Um, very interesting and thought-provoking. Uh, but I think uh, we're running out, we've run out of time. So I'd just like to thank you again, David, for your time and for answering all the questions uh, with such passion. So, well, thanks again.
And just to like say a quick goodbye, I would like to ask everyone who's comfortable with this to turn on their camera to well just wave bye bye and give a virtual clap to our um, closing session speaker. Well, let me first say that thank you very much, Monica, for inviting me to to this. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, uh, and um, thank you all very much indeed for your your questions, which have started off more um more thoughts in me, uh, uh, and and um, thank you for, for, the, for the whole thing. Uh, and um, although, of course, I know this is taking place at the, the end of the conference, it's also taking place before the beginning of the conference. And so we're in a rather peculiar kind of time warp here, but, but that is perhaps um, uh, the way into the future. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thanks for this last reflection. I loved it. <laughs> well, just let's thank you after our speaker. Thanks again. <laughs> Someone says, this was fascinating. Thank you so much. And... Uh...